Hey everybody, Dr. Jensen. We're here with part three, sampling and survey basics. So we're gonna jump into survey questions. Constructing survey questions. This is kind of the fun part. Um, we've already gotten our sample and that's in place and now we're ready to ask them the questions. First, be knowledgeable about what's been previously studied with your population. Valid survey questions could be identified ahead of time from previous surveys. Use these questions or construct your own. So comment on that. It's easy to go, oh, I just want to write my questions, but it pays off because you can often spend a little bit of time and find completely intact surveys that have exactly what you want. Often you're not the first person to have gone after a topic. So go look around for surveys from other organizations, state, city, county, jail, you name it, where you can find something similar. <clears throat> it pays off because now you have a survey you don't have to write. Surveys are pretty much a free for all. Um, you can usually borrow and use anything out there on the web. Um, you may want to check if you see it's an academic survey or one that came from a corporate to see if there's any protection with it. In that case, you would want to ask permission from the person that developed it. But otherwise, there's really no harm in borrowing survey questions or entire survey instruments. They're pretty freely shared. So second, it's important to identify exactly what you're attempting to measure. So maybe you want to do something on marijuana laws. Would you want feelings, perceptions, knowledge, attitudes, actions, opinions, experiences, identities? Because all of those would get at different kinds of, of you know, elements of marijuana laws. You know, so what do you want? Maybe you want more than one thing, and that's fine, but you just have to decide that in advance. So the types of survey questions people usually write are either closed-ended or open-ended. Closed-ended questions offer those predetermined answer choices. Often a focus group and an early discussion can help you get the themes and topics that you want to use for those answer choices. I call them pick lists, A, B, C, D. Those are the ones we see the most. They're pretty easy to analyze and develop. Open-ended questions just kind of let people tell their story. So it's like, tell me about your experience um, losing your children when you were incarcerated. And, uh, you know, just lets them kind of talk. You know, it kind of just gives them a, a topic or a script, and then they speak freely after that. So um, they can also kind of get that good, rich, qualitative data that we were talking about that's kind of unique to that person. But don't do too many of those in a survey because they can be a pain in the neck to analyze. So if you have 100 or 200 people that all wrote open-ended responses, like little paragraphs of their story, that's a lot of text to have to go back and read and analyze and find all the commonalities and patterns and themes in there. So be careful with how many of those you use. They are rich and fun and you can use quotes and stuff from things people said, but um, don't get too carried away there because <clears throat> again, time consuming stuff to look at. So you have to be practical. Be sure your questions are distinct. Do not overlap each other in concept and allow for all possible responses. So my little hint at the bottom, leave one or two responses available for an answer choice of none, I don't know, not applicable, other, for people who don't fit into your categories. When you use the response of other, I always tell people say other, please specify. So then you ask them to provide more information besides just other. So that way you say, okay, what is it about your response that's other? And they give you a reason why. You can actually analyze that. So I always try to get more data if I have the opportunity. Scales. These are things like uh, strongly agree, agree, disagree. Okay, so they usually have... Um, a variation in intensity or, or degree of which something happens. Um, these are kind of fun, but again, they can get a little long for someone to take if you have too many of these. But they can also help cover things as a little less directly that people may not have a firm answer on. Be sure to avoid being tricky with the negative statement, like inserting the word not in there, because that could be really confusing. And then they have inaccurate responses. Keep in mind, some participants may move quickly through the scales answering the questions based on their overall attitude or experience and not carefully considering each item. Okay, so to avoid this problem, you could vary the answer choices with favorable and unfavorable ones or order them uh, differently with different question types, put them in different parts of the survey, different sections. Um, there are two problems we're talking about. Number one is survey fatigue. So survey fatigue is what happens when you get tired of taking a survey. It's just too long. You're spending way more time than what you were told on it and you're very motivated to quit it so this is really bad because then you only get a partial survey or no survey at all okay we want surveys returned so we get data we can analyze autopilot is when we are also very tired of taking a survey and we stop caring about it 
So we just go click, 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 click. We go all the way through the survey and we're just trying to get to the end. And we feel too guilty about quitting it, but we want to submit it and be on with our day. And, you know, so autopilot is a, usually a completed survey, but it's inaccurate because we didn't really care what we were clicking anyway. Okay, so you don't want those two things to happen. And a good survey design can help you avoid survey fatigue and autopilot. Question design. You can ask about hypothetical rather than direct. And sometimes these are a little more gentle. Um, people are more willing to answer them. There may be people in which the situation described or the question doesn't apply, but you can still try to glean what they would do if they had the experience. So this information could still be meaningful to us, even if it's a little less direct. So think about it this way. Maybe you're trying to test um, emergency management type stuff, like people taking their uh, first step at addressing a crisis. You know, what is your first step you would do? Rank um, how many, you know, different things you would do. Uh, you know, it can test their decision making, following protocol, or show you what they remember from a training as to what they should be doing. So those are all really good things you might want to know. And they're hypothetical. So overall, test your questions by thinking aloud, have people verbalize their thoughts and responses to questions because this can surface and eliminate the bad ones. So let's look at some bad questions. And what is a bad question? It isolates the range of responses and limits the data you get back. So this is what we would call the problem of not being exhaustive. Doesn't give enough answer choices to, to cover all the possible answers. It suggests certain thoughts and responses unintentionally and leads the person toward a certain response rather than what they would actually say, their natural one. Um, we call that a leading question. It forces respondents to rank their answers within a question with it's not really difficult. It's tough to know how large or small the differences are between one and another. So, you know, this is when we say rank it this on one to 10. And we probably could say what number one and number 10 is, you know, highest or lowest or most or least. But when it gets into the differences between like what a five and a six is, we might not really know or care. So we might want to think about that, too. Good and bad questions. So these are different examples of, of what we just talked about. Why did the dispatcher do a bad job? Well, that's a leading question, right? Because we're already suggesting a judgment call on the job performance of the dispatcher. We're leading them to a certain kind of response. So you don't want to do that. Um, that is the same thing as we see in bullet number four. Don't you think Congress is spending too much money? You know, we, we don't want to lead them to a conclusion before they've even really thought about the topic. Uh, we'll go to the second bullet. Do you like the message content, the frequency, clarity of which your supervisor provides feedback? That's what we call a barreled question. There's just too many different things happening in that question that we're trying to test. Um, so if we just had yes, no at the end of that question, we wouldn't know what the yes or no is referring to. So this is where we might want to separate each of those items in there and do a different question on each. Okay. Uh, the third bullet which type of traffic stop is easiest to perform? A, distracted driver. B, aggressive driver. C, motorist assist, distracted driver. This is where we have what we call mutually exclusive problems. Each of those answers should be exclusive from the other. Okay, A and C kind of overlap because they both have the word distracted driver in them. So again, we wouldn't really be able to distinguish those two very well. Uh, fifth bullet down, we've already talked about the Congress one. What was your BMI and RBI last FY? Well, BMI is body mass index and RBI is runs batted in and FY is fiscal year. But you'd have to know all those acronyms to know what the question was even about. And when you think about it, it's kind of a ridiculous question. But you don't want to use so much jargon and language that your uh, respondents don't understand that they get confused or they skip your question. Uh, the last one, what would prevent you from utilizing a help desk or customer support phone line? Check all that apply. That's actually a decent question. Um, you just want to make sure that you're prepared for the person that checks all the boxes and you know what to do with that. Okay, but that one's not bad. That's actually a pretty good question. Okay, question sequence. Group similar topics together. Don't change the topic too often because that's hard for people to follow. You can use subheadings and then indicate a number of questions for a certain topic. It tells people what's coming next. Um, so you can say uh, questions five through eight have to do with your attitude toward marijuana laws. Um, sorry, sorry, marijuana laws. And questions nine through 12 have to do with your experiences with marijuana, marijuana laws. So that way they can kind of prepare for the change and wrap up the last business they just did and get ready for the new business. Remember, the order of questions will influence the results. So you'll want to play with when to ask things. And then finally, collect responses to open-ended questions, usually at the end when someone's had a chance to review everything and recall all their thoughts and experiences along the way. And they have a more prepared story to tell in that open text box. They get to just talk. 
Uh, you have to be careful though, because sometimes if they're experiencing survey fatigue or autopilot, they're going to skip that open-ended question and just click submit. So you may want to introduce that a little earlier than the very last question, um, because we just want to end it so bad. We don't want to sit and tell our story. Um, a kind of one more comment on the second bullet, the order of questions. You want to think about that. I was working on a survey with the Department of Defense and it was on sexual assault. They actually were very gentle with how they got into that topic, and I'm glad they, they did a good job of that. Um, they didn't just start out by question number one, have you been sexually assaulted while serving in the military? Um, that's pretty abrupt and, and uh, sensitive to ask somebody. So they're going to kind of prepare the person before they get there. They ask the person about their experience serving in the military, questions about their unit, about their relationships with people in their unit, conversations, um, then conversations that might be less appropriate, uh, maybe actions that were not appropriate, and then eventually into assaultive behaviors. And that's a much better way to get into something that is sensitive, private, or difficult to talk about. Confidentiality. So you should be able to maintain your confidentiality before and after completing a survey. You got to tell people um, or you got to determine who's going to have access to everything, establish a way to keep it secure with passwords, encryption and so forth. And if you're going to do an email survey, use the BCC line. It's called blind carbon copy when inserting participant emails so that all the respondents don't get each other's emails. That would be bad. When you administer your survey, participants should be given a brief introduction to the survey, including the purpose, the sponsoring group, how much time it's going to take, statement of confidentiality, and an explanation of how you're going to use the data. When they feel a little more certain about what it's all for. As far as response rates go, for email and online surveys, they're very cheap. They can reach a lot of people in moments. They require people to have a minimum level of technical skill to get links to work and so forth. So if you're interviewing people that don't have computer skills, you might want to think about that. You also have to think about the fact that you may have technical limitations if you're going inside a prison or a jail. Certain devices may not be allowed because they're considered contraband. So you may have to do the good old fashioned pencil and paper survey. You may want to consider incentives for completion like prizes. People usually like a prize rather than a chance at a prize. So keep that in mind. Use professional level graphic art, official logos or letterhead so they feel confident that this is not a scam or a phishing scheme or something like that. So they feel very certain in, in it being official business. Um, email filters, junk and spam folders can deter messages from reaching people. So keep that in mind. Increase your response rate with multiple mailings and reminders. Give sufficient resources to accomplish this. Have a person assigned to assist with any technical difficulties if people can't get the links to work, blah, blah, blah. When you administer your survey, uh, consider if you want or need to collect contact info at the beginning or the end. There can be valid reasons for doing this, especially if um, time or energy will be exhausted during longer surveys. You want to conclude with a thank you statement and contact info for people that have questions for you. Um, overall, your respondents will vary in, uh, in the way that they answer questions, depending on their time, their skills, reading ability, uh, interpretation, intelligence, mood, all those things. Surveys are largely determined by the timeline of the project as far as when you need to collect everything, get everything analyzed and disseminated. So you have to be reasonable with how long you keep a survey open. Um, it's unreasonable to only keep it open for a day or two, especially if your, your population's on the move. Okay. Eventually, when you get all the data back, you can, and when using simple random samples, you can generalize the results easily. Okay, you can use data and uh, statistical software like SPSS or SAS. You can analyze stuff. You start making charts and histograms and running frequencies and seeing how everybody answered all the questions. I think that's the fun data nerd part. That's what I like. And in case you haven't fallen asleep yet, here's your cue. So this is for reference. Um, just basic reading. Lawrence Orchard is kind of one of the classics in social research. This is where most of the highlights of what you saw came from. So hopefully you feel a little better prepared at administering surveys, have some helps and uh, hints that'll, that'll help you if your organization tasks you to do one. And uh, other than that, we'll be seeing you next time. Bye-bye.